Welcome to this event. Thank you for coming. Um, let me just start with some questions and answer. Raising of hand of sort. Now, most of you are familiar with the life stories of the Buddha, yes? So you know about his miraculous conception, his uh, fantastic birth when the baby came out and made, what, seven steps walk? You know about that, right? You know about his princely life? Are you familiar? That he was born a prince and that he lost his mother when he was just a few days old. You know about that, right? Yes. Never heard of before? And you must have heard of the prophecy, yes? The prophecy, what was it about? That he was either going to be the universal monarch or he was going to be an enlightened being, teacher of the, or one of the greatest religious teacher of the world, yes? Did you know the significance of that little prophecy? To be a universal monarch means he was going to be, to have power over men. To be a teacher, the greatest religious teacher, is to have power over mind. So that was the birth prophecy, that he was either going to have sovereign power over men, or he was going to be someone with capacity to help people tame mind. Okay? Anyhow, you must have know, you must know of the story about his uh, father being practical. You know, he was supposed to be a king, right? He was practical and sensible, and he decided his son was going to be a universal monarch. And therefore, what did he do? Keep, kept, the prince, kept the prince into the palace, cloistered, sheltered, luxurious life. Apparently spent his entire 29 years not seeing, not seeing old age, sick man, the death, and so on. Huh? That was supposed to be the story. And then what happened? At 29, somewhere in 29, he decided he was going to check out the palace outside. So he went out, and then what did he do? Lo and behold, he saw four sites, the famous four sites. You all know about that, right? And then because of the four sites, on the day that the son was born, he left. Yes? Hey, I'm testing you now, you know. <laughs> so he left. And he fled the palace in a dramatic flee from the, from, from the palace and then went off somewhere. He, he, he struggled, struggled for six years. And voila, on enlightenment night, had a ferocious fight with, the, with Mara. Uh, you know about that, right? Mara came with how many armies? Don't know. Ten armies, right? Mara came with ten armies. Buddha had a ferocious fight. And he won. And the rest is history. So all that, that's the story that we all know. Now, how many of you know about the Buddha's life after enlightenment? Not much, eh? Sort of know who was the Buddha, but that's about it. You know, unfortunately, all these are storytelling through the ages. Each generation embellishing more and more of the Buddha's story. The real man has been lost in the fog of history, in the capable and dramatic hands of creative, imaginative storytellers. From his time, centuries of stories, stories upon stories, it was only in the 20th, 19th, 20th century that the real Buddha surfaced because of Western researchers, Western historians, with their rigorous method of research, they began to, pin, to piece together the Buddha's life. Today, 21st century, scholars know a lot more about Buddha 
And the information were mainly from the Buddha's own mouth. Stories of his life were taken and pieced together from his discourses. When he was teaching, when he was alive, he was teaching. After he passed on, after he passed away, the students gathered those material from his teaching. And from those material came what we know as discourses. So one source of material about the Buddha's life came from his own mouth. The second source of the Buddha's life, archaeological remains from a couple of hundreds after his time, the time of Emperor Asoka of India. He became a Buddhist. He, like all good, devout Buddhists, was a huge fan of the Buddha. So he went around and he planted stone some pillars and, stat and stupas and, and all kinds of things he was putting all over the place to tell the world of his time that he was a Buddhist. And from those archaeological remains and from the Buddha's own words, the real historical Buddha came alive. Now, one thing scholars know clearly today. We know many parts of the conventional narratives, the, the parts which I was telling you about, they were probably wrong. I call it artistic licensing through the ages, most of which dramatized for effects. For instance, his family, they were not royalty. Oh, Buddha wasn't a prince. Sad. He was at best, the Sakyan was, they were at best a tribal confederation. They were rich. They were dripping with wealth. But they were not royalty. In fact, the Sakyan territory belonged to the empire that was ruled by this king called Pase Nadi. And the Buddhist scholars know that. It's just that they couldn't get you to hear it. Second, the father, as I said, wasn't king. Yeah? He was, at best, chairman of the village elders, council, council of elders. And this is even rotation chairmanship. Huh? Meaning to say he does not become king, I mean, he did not become chairman, and then he stayed as chairman until he died. No, it didn't work like that. They took turns. How do we know? Because different suitors got different council member, council chairman. Buddha, now this is the big one. Buddha probably didn't see the four sides. Ah, uh, yeah. It cannot be that his entire 29 years nobody died. He cannot be that he cannot see his own father growing old. Yeah? His mother died when he was a few days old. It cannot be an entire lifespan without seeing your own relatives and family members becoming old or dying. He never attended a single funeral in his entire life. Seriously? Now, in his own words, I don't want to read the whole thing, but basically what this tells you, this is in his words, huh? Arya Pariyasana Sutta. He basically said, life is impermanent. I, with a limited shelf life, why am I chasing after things which will change, which will die off? It doesn't make sense. Not meaningful. In another sutta, this is what he said. Living the household life is not easy. To live it purely, therefore, I will renounce. After the long thing, it's basically that. I will renounce. Because it's not easy to lead the Sangha life, to practice in the lay life. Anything here about foresights? No. Anything here about dashing through the nights? No. In fact, in another sutta, which is not here, in another sutta, we call it the Mahapadana Sutta, he said his parents grieving with tears on their faces. 
i.e. parents knew or at least he knew when when he left he knew they were crying if he were dashing through the nights he wouldn't have seen them crying see what i'm saying and there was no ferocious fight with mara in fact in his own words he actually said it was a quiet night it was a tranquil night he went deep into jhana and in his deepest of jhana his mind cleared up brilliantly so it was not a ferocious fight with an external mara but it was a defeat of the internal maras and he declared that himself that when the fight was when the fight the battle within was over he knew his job was done for himself the job was done those biographic narratives they are not important so the facts and the fiction it's okay let them be but what is important is that the buddha was enlightened and he was awakened that he was enlightened and awakened meant this one he had a unique world view what does it mean no preconceived biases and delusions coloring reality as is you see most of us we can't help it from the day we were born to the day you are today you would have decades not centuries decades decades of external stimulation and teachings and internal digesting and reacting so whatever that you are today however you see the world today you see it through a prism of biases assumptions corruptions or whatever it is a lifetime of construction that leads to what you are today when the buddha was awakened and enlightened that entire construction construction i don't know lens was gone he saw the mind as it is he saw reality of the world because your reality comes from here the world the reality of the world as is so that's point 1 and he saw the true nature of the mind and reality and he was no longer fettered to impurities of the mind all of us have this problem we have loba greed we have dosa anger it's natural we have ego buddha when he was enlightened all those dissipated no more impurities the way the reason why i use the word fettered is because you look at how you react to the world greed and anger and ego drives us we are tied together to those mental conditions when buddha was awakened and realized he didn't have those mental conditions so he was free free in mind and above all he no longer experienced dukkha suffering not even in the slightest slightest of experience no dukkha all these were for himself right it's he realized he became pure he became enlightened it was for himself but for the rest of us he left behind an incredible incomparable gift a method of cultivation that enables us also to see reality of the world as he did if it was only about the buddha and his own reality story ends but it's because of the method the training method the dhamma that he left behind for us and that's the gift that we as buddhists will uphold should uphold if we see the world as he did we will experience nibbana one day 
as he did. An unparalleled state of unconditioned bliss. The lights of which we have never known. That's what makes him special. His incomparable wisdom, the purity of the mind, and a mind of unshakable, unconditioned peace. Now, there are numerous things that we can, I can go on. I wrote a book about Buddha, so I can go on and on and on. But we only have 45 minutes, so I can only say three things. Three things I will highlight. Buddha was a man of science. Buddha was a self-made man. Buddha was a universal man. For thousands of years, even up to today, men believe in the greater power of divinity. Countless of religions through the ages, through time and space, countless of religion, every land, every tribe, everybody believe in God or gods that bless and protect men. In the Buddha's time, the conventional mainstream religion of the day was the Vedic religion, the Vedic faith. How does man come by these religious beliefs? Through the ages, huh, mind you, every, every culture you can think of, every land you can think of. Why do everyone have a religion? The reason is man has fear. Man is afraid of the unknown. Deadly natural calamities, accidents, misfortune, bad luck, sway luck. Man wants assurance that he can control his environment, the external conditions. Man has strong attachment to people he loves, to himself. When you have fear of losing people you love, you will make a deal with anything if you are assured that they can deliver the results you want. So religion arose from all these above motivations. Man was afraid of the unknown. Man wants some control. And he can understand if he makes a deal with gods, if he makes a deal with the natural forces out there, and the deal holds, he'll be fine. Deals he know how to make. Contrary nature, he doesn't know. See what I'm saying? So man sought a relationship with divine powers to keep him and his family safe, healthy, prosperous, and therefore, presumably happy. And if it works, I mean, if you survive, it works, right? If it works, and your tribe survive, you make sure your kids know the formula to staying alive. And you will teach them all the th This is how you do your ritual. This is how you bow. This is what you do. This is what you must have on the table. And why? Because our harvest is good. See that? So for centuries, men highly prized knowledge of the elders, of the ancients, scriptures, campfire stories, not your campfire today. In the old days, campfire is when elders come together to disperse their wisdom, okay? And so on and so forth. How did science come about? Science came about when some maverick questioned, challenged conventional assumptions and conclusions. Science came about because a maverick asked, why, huh? He wanted proof, verifiable empirical evidence, birth of science. Today, we call it the scientific method of deriving truth. What does that mean? Or for those of you who are scientists, doctors, physicists, and so on there, the scientific method of deriving truth. The first thing, you start, you don't start by saying, I know the answer. Yes? You start by assuming you don't know the answer. If you assume you know the answer, that's religion. If you assume there is an answer out there and I got to find it, that's science. So you start with a theory, 
a hypothesis, a premise, and you look for verifiable data to substantiate your premise. Through empirical testing, i.e. direct observation of using your sixth sense basis, you gather quanti quantitative and qualitative data. Objective, verifiable, factual data. What does the word verifiable mean? It means anybody and everybody can collect similar, if not identical data. With sufficient verifiable data, you can form a tentative conclusion. And then you can identify the underpinning conditions for the conclusions. And above all, you must test results. Set condition, correct same condition, you can replicate results. If your conclusion is correct, the outcome, the result will always be replicated. You take a match, you strike a match, you take a match, you strike a match. If the match is dry, it should light up. You say, oh, this experiment is simple. Trust me, in ancient time, not so simple. Click, 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 click. That's how it goes, okay? Same condition. Anybody with two stones can create fire. Buddha used the exact same method, same scientific method to discover Dhamma. He set out seeking to find answers to why so much stresses and strain and mental pain in the mind. Why is there Dukkha? Through careful, objective, microscopic observation of the mind, of his mind, he saw how his mind engages the world. He studied feelings. He studied perceptions, volitional thoughts. He studied them. He observes. He checked out mental assumptions. He looked at thinking pattern and so on. And eventually, he came upon and established the noble truths as you know it. What is this? He asked himself, what is this problem confronting all living beings? Dukkha, suffering. What is the origin of this problem? Craving. This, this is figured out. This is figured out. What is the solution? Craving can cease. Dukkha can cease. What is the method? How do you replicate the results through the Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path is a method of rewiring and reshaping mental habits and instincts. It is not magic. It is empirical observation of the mind done by a master psychologist with no modern science aid. He figured out the answers. Buddha used exactly the same six sense bases that we all have. The same brain. His brain wasn't born bigger than ours. Same brain. Closely examined the nature of his mind. Penetrated with insight the reality of the mind. Then, he didn't stop there. Then, he designed a training method so that everyone else who comes after him can do it for themselves. Anyone who is sincere and seeks to restore mental health, if they apply his Eightfold Path method sincerely and judiciously, they will get the results they want. I.e., they will see Nibbana, taste it for themselves. So, would they use what we can easily recognize as a scientific method for distilling knowledge to help him solve the mystery of the mind? Let me recap. Huh? Gather quantifiable data empirically, careful verification of the data, identical set conditions, replicable results and conditions. Dhamma method, 
Dhamma training method can be replicated by anyone for himself and he will, fail, he will find the same exact unconditioned bliss. 2,500 years of practitioners applying the same training method, enjoying the same outcome to this very day in the age of science. Now, hypothetically, hypothetically, if all the Dhamma books, all the books containing Dhamma knowledge were to disappear, what is said? Another Buddha will come along and rediscover the path. Yes, you know this. Even if Buddha was to go away, gone and the Dhamma is gone, another Buddha will come along and rediscover the path. What is it? It is science. Dhamma exists whether or not man has the knowledge. And man, man, a great man, will rediscover it. Like men will rediscover gravity, atoms, molecules, dhamma. No difference from other scientific knowledge. So what's the moral of the story? What is in it for you? If we call ourselves Buddhists, the Buddha must be our role model. So therefore, you do not start by assuming you have the answer. You will examine problems objectively. You must exercise critical thinking. You look for empirical data that can be verified. Our conclusions must stand the test of scientific scrutiny. A Buddhist should not, cannot be caught up by superstition and dogmatic close-mindedness. Buddha's disciples do not look to gods or divinity to solve his problems. Buddha's disciples do not go to gods and divinity for solace and refuge. And Buddha's disciples do not go to gods for protection and blessings. Buddha's disciples depend on his own effort to be happy. Now, in Buddhism, we speak of faith. Perhaps it's more appropriate to call it confidence, but a confidence that is anchored on knowledge and experiential insights. So the more complete your knowledge, the more complete your knowledge of your mind, the stronger will be your sadda, your faith. Okay? So that's point one. The self-made man. This brings me to my next point. A self-made man, by definition, is one who achieves success despite the most disadvantageous conditions. Now, let me ask you, uh, this way you can raise your hand, huh? Let me ask you, between the man who inherited his money and another who had achieved material success on his own, who do you admire more? Former or the latter? In our century, in our century, we said, oh, the man who succeeded despite the odds because the success is probably the result of hard work, discipline, intelligence, maybe a stroke of luck. But why does it matter in our century? Why does it matter that it is the man who achieve it on his own? Because we are all not born of great and rich families. All of us are, I am, I am, average, regular folk. Working class parents, working class myself, regular people. I don't have crown on my head, not blessed with a silver, golden, diamond, platinum spoon. And so are all of us, right? And therefore, the self-made man is a much powerful story, ma. He can do it, I can do it. Because you, can't go, you cannot go back and change your parents. Too late. But, 
Did you know throughout history, the story of the self-made man is terribly rare? That's why you got songs sung about the self-made man. You have stories told of the individuals, movies made of... I mean, there is no movies of ancient time of someone who born like this, die like this. You know, it's much more engaging if you talk about someone who came from the ashes and became the phoenix. Yeah? So for us, but, but in reality, in reality, the successful man throughout history has been one born of power and affluence. So even the Buddhas, the conventional Buddha story, what did it say? Birthright and destiny. That's the conventional Buddha story. He was born to be a Buddha. It's a prophecy. He had lineage. He's the prince. His family was famous and dripping with wealth. It's pure royal blood. It's all about birth, huh? Pure royal blood. And to throw in for good measure, he was handsome. <laughs> Money, connection, power, looks. What else you want? In the Buddha's eyes, none of those external attributes matter. He walked away from his family. He lived the life of a pauper for his entire life. He struggled monumentally to conquer his mind. Mind you, I didn't put it up here. I should have another story. He talks about the struggle to the point that he had to, by all the crazy things that he did, to a point where he almost killed himself. If he had killed himself, no more story. No more gathering. For details, read my book. <laughs> Anyhow, enlightened by his own efforts, and for the rest of his life, he lived in absolute contentment and unconditioned bliss. The Buddha's ultimate spiritual success was by his sheer effort. Hence, hence, in the Buddhist pantheon of greatness, what is the Buddhist pantheon of greatness? You have four saints, right? Four types of saints. Anybody? The stream enterer, the ones returner. Hello, I'm answering my own question. The never returner, the arahants. Huh? Did you know they are all differentiated by levels of wisdom and insight and purity of mind. The stream enterer, first level of penetrative glimpse of the Ma, and his entire behavior, his entire conduct is transformed. The stream enterer will never ever again in the maximum allocated life of seven, if he ever had to go all the way to seven will never ever commit unwholesome acts that could land him in hell. Good conduct, pure conduct. But the highest is the Arahan. Complete wisdom, not a tinge, not a tinge of arising of greed and anger. Arising there. For most of us, it's there that you realize, <gasps> here already. No, 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 Arahan, no arising of greed and anger. Why is it significant? Why am I telling you all this? Because Nibbana, the highest good, that enlightened mental states where craving had completely ceased, one lives in perfect unconditioned bliss and peace. That is achieved strictly by the individual for himself through his effort, his discipline, his practice, his wisdom. Family connections, lineage, looks, intelligence, you inherit, you are born with it. It's in your DNA. Wisdom, you can cultivate. Conduct is yours to act with restraint. You 
are the one who decide whether or not you will lash out or you will hold. You conquer negative instincts and habits. You tame your desires and anger. Buddha talk about four kinds of people. Born in the dark, grow into the light. Born in the dark, sink darker. Born in the light, descend into the dark. Born in the light, rise to be lighter. What does it mean? It's the individual's effort. He, born, he can be born in the worst of circumstances, materially, even in a, in a family where his entire life is about people drinking and gambling and fighting and so on. You can be born in that circumstances, but it is within the individual to make his way out towards the light, towards spirituality, towards even material success, but spirituality is the emphasis. For better or for worse, by our own choices and decisions, we are happier or more wretched. Our own choices and decisions. Moral of the story? All religious beliefs assume that men needed divine help for happiness. That men will always be inferior to and lower than divinity that man is helpless and in need of divine blessings. Buddha taught his disciple, man is the master of his own destiny. Man is responsible for his own happiness and shapes his own success or failure. Man makes his life happy or tragic by how he creates his own reality, how he narrates the story of his life to himself and to others, how he treats other people, what he decides is important or not. You think about it, your own life. You spend your entire life telling people how sad you are, how sad you are, how happy can you be? <laughs> but if you tell everyone, even in the worst of circumstances, you say, don't worry, no scared, things will sort themselves out, I'm fine. Then what are you? Fine law. <laughs> it is just like that. Buddha taught that man owes nothing to God and everything to his own action, his own deliberate action. The Buddha's disciples do not pray to gods. The Buddha's disciples respect gods, honors them. They, are, they were good people. They deserve the blessings. But you don't go around bowing and praying to them. That was his time. Buddha's disciple doesn't believe in destiny. He believes in the conditions of the mind. It's the conditions of your mind that shape your reality. Buddha's disciples believe in making wise choices. What do I mean by wise choices? If you choose a course of action that is beneficial to others and to yourself, you are the Buddha's disciple. If you choose a course of action that benefits only you, you and your shadow, you are not a disciple of the Buddha. Buddha's disciples believe in wholesome actions, wholesome conduct, patience, restraint, giving, metta, compassion. The last one, I put it there for good measure. Come, everybody thinks about the boomerang that comes from the past. That is a wrong understanding of the word karma. I want to clarify this. Buddha in his teaching had always say, karma are the actions that you perform deliberately, whether it arises in your mind, from your words, or from the things that you do, if you deliberately perform those actions, those actions leave an imprint on your mind, on your memory. The regrets, regret that you scolded someone, that leaves an imprint. 
those, those imprints are karma. And if you believe in karma, if you say, I'm a Buddhist disciple, I'm a Buddhist, and I believe in karma, then never in your daily life would you kick somebody, would you scold somebody. Why? Because it leaves an imprint in your mind. When man successfully realizes the true nature of his mind, the simple man becomes the highest being, the teacher of gods and men. All these by himself, by his own efforts. Finally, on the universal man. Now, from time immemorial, what is the normal human instinct? To divide the world into me versus you, us versus them. Yeah? Did you know that the Buddhist tribe, the Sakyans, they were amongst the most xenophobic. They are champion, xenophobic. Okay? They were so racist, they only marry amongst themselves. The father was Sakyan, the mother was Kolian. And these two tribes, the sons tribe, these two tribes will marry amongst themselves. They are the pure blood. They were so extreme, they wouldn't marry their king. You know, Pasi Nadi, I mentioned him earlier. Pasi Nadi wanted a Sakyan princess, a Sakyan lady. Why? Because he kawan kawan with Buddha, his friend Buddha. He wanted to be with the Buddha, he wanted a Sakyan lady. The Sakyan scratched their head and they gave him a pseudo Sakyan. <laughs> the illegitimate daughter of one of the Sakyan council members. I call it Mao Pai Huo. In Cantonese, Teng Ji Tong. They just put it there, you know? And so he did, they, they sent him there. And that eventually led to the genocide. The product of the marriage between the Mao Pai Huo and Pasenadi, the emperor, the king, the two of them produced a son who found out that his birth was less than pure, went on a killing campaign and massacred his own family. Okay? Story found in my book. Buddha was brought up with that worldview. Yet, yet the community that he founded, the Sangha, was anchored on the principle of universal acceptance. He called the monks Sakya Putia. Sakya, you know, his clan, Putia, the son of. They were sons, his sons, all the same. All caste. You think caste system is bad today? It was there in the past. It was just as bad, maybe, I don't know, worse. I don't know, okay? In other words, the, sake, the, the, the Sangha that he set up, the community that he created, has zero discrimination. Everyone is equal in the community. No discrimination based on caste, tribe, ethnicity, age, gender. From the regular person to the serial killer. Angulimala, in case you don't know. From kids as young as seven to elderly as old as in their 80s. From, from women who were ranked lower than cows were admitted into the community. The only criteria for entry, are you sincere? Will you put in the effort? Once they are in the Sangha community, everyone gets a vote. They are treated equally. Seniority based on years in rope. The Sangha community actively opposed caste discrimination down to how to teach the Dhamma. Two Brahmins who joined the Dhamma, who joined the Sangha, one day, this two Brahmin, ex-Brahmin ex monk, went to the Buddha and said, would you, holy sir, introduce Vedic Sanskrit into the teachings as an expression of the holiness of the teaching? Buddha's reply, no, never. 
Dhamma must be taught in the language of the listeners. There will be no holy language, no holy scripture. Because if you want to put Dhamma in the hands of only the exclusive few who could learn the special language, that would hamper Dhamma di uh, dissemination, right? Not only would it hamper Dhamma dissemination, it will put power into the hands of the few who know. So therefore, no. Language is not Dhamma. Dhamma is beyond language. And when the individual had completed his Dhamma journey and realized Nibbana, the taste of spiritual awakening, the taste of Nibbana, is identical for everyone. It does not mean that I'm a Brahmin, my taste better. Your sudras, you only have a quarter of the taste. Everyone the same. So what's the moral of the story? If you call yourself a Buddhist, you too must embrace all living beings without discrimination. You learn not to see the world in duality, but in commonality. We are like everyone else. We are not superior or inferior. Our well-being is tied up in the common good. You cultivate empathy to a point you can walk in another's shoes and feel for him. We teach ourselves, we tell ourselves, all living beings experience dukkha. All living beings are afraid of pain and death. All living beings love and feel sorrow. And all living beings have greed and anger and are capable of moral restraint and spiritual enlightenment. So we do not add to another's pain Instead, we should be a source of comfort, security, peace of mind, and happiness for others. The foremost qualities that Buddha had highlighted, the Brahma Vihara, living like the Brahma, what it means is immeasurable, unlimited store of friendliness, compassion. Mudita is rejoicing without being tied up by feelings. Feelings make you selective, discriminating. Equanimity enables you to treat everyone alike. So if you are truly Buddhist, you say you are, if you truly are, we cease, we stop judging others. Because we are no saints. We are all still fettered by greed, anger and delusion. We have pride and ego. When we judge, Often, it is our own greed and anger, judging, doing the running commentaries. Instead, as a Buddhist, we focus on our own spiritual practice. And we doggedly, doggedly work to tame our own defilements, each to his own karma. Conclusion. We start off our spiritual journey looking at the historical Buddha as a role model. As we bow to the Buddha, we tell ourselves we want to be like him and to uphold all the qualities associated with him. Wisdom, virtues, compassion, patience, courage, equanimity, and an unshakable mind. This Dharma journey will end with us internalizing those same qualities that were the Buddha. That's the true meaning of the word Buddha. To rise above the weaknesses that the human is capable of and becoming divine. That's the legacy of our teacher. Dhamma is the legacy of our teacher. And as long as one more practitioner walks the path, sincerely, correctly, with knowledge and determination, the Buddha will live on. Thank you. <laughs>